What a pathetic sight Boris Johnson makes. He is desperately, desperately trying to save his own skin and he's willing to throw anyone under the bus to do it. That includes his staff. Potentially, it also includes the BBC and migrants crossing the channel. All incredibly cynical, incredibly opportunistic. We're going to talk through his plan to save himself blow by blow. I'm joined by Ash Sarkar. How are you doing, Ash? I'm very well, thank you, Michael. I'm here for Operation Red Meat, baby. That's me, you, quality content. <laughs> Operation Red Meat and Operation Big Old Dog. Save Big Dog. Save Big Dog. I'll get it all right as we as we go forward. We're also going to talk about a, a Prince Andrew story, the very cynical legal argument he is using. Um, and actually, most of the show is devoted to the various, the various cynical plans to um, save Boris Johnson. Um, we do want to know your comments, so do tweet them on the hashtag TiskySour or put a comment in the comments box. Britain hates Boris Johnson, but to save his skin, the Prime Minister apparently has two last-ditch plans. The first is called Operation Save Big Dog, apparently a name he came up with himself. Operation Save Big Dog involves sacrificing the smaller dogs in Downing Street to save the leader of the pack. The other plan has been titled Operation Red Meat. That one involves announcing a bunch of right-wing policies to distract Tory backbenchers and attempt to move the public conversation along. Before we go into detail about both of those plans, some proof Britain really does hate Boris. According to YouGov, 72% of the public have an unfavourable opinion of Boris Johnson. Only 20% have a positive one. That gives him a net score of minus 52, which, as this chart from the Times shows, is lower than Theresa May's worst ratings and almost as bad as Corbyn's worst score. And we know how harangued and attacked he was by the press. For more fine-grained analysis of voters' opinions of Boris Johnson, we can look to focus groups. James Johnson is a former Downing Street pollster who now runs a PR company. He tweeted about a focus group he conducted in the so-called Red Wall this weekend. Three of the quotes he picked out from participants were, it's the fact that he lied. If he turned round and said, yep, I've done it, I'm sorry, that would have been okay. But he lied. What else has he been lying about? Someone else said, I think he's completely lost everyone's trust. My concern is, if all the Conservatives are now standing behind him, do we have the confidence in them? Are they just going to sweep it all under the rug too? And then James Johnson says, everyone had voted Tory in 2019 in this focus group, asked if they would vote for Boris again now. Not one person put their hand up. So the whole focus group, which was people who voted Conservative in 2019, none of them are going to vote Tory. Given all that, the rescue plans better be pretty damn good. For more details on those, we can look to the Sunday Times. In terms of blaming staffers, Tim Shipman reported on a meeting held last week in Number 10, where he writes, Johnson did not rant, but made it clear he was furious with his team. He had a massive go at them for failing to sort things out, one of those present told a friend. And then a quote, he made it clear he thought they had let him down. Boris's view is that he is not to blame, that everyone else is to blame. No surprises there. Um, in terms of who will be sacrificed, the Sunday Times report that Martin Reynolds, Johnson's principal private secretary who sent an email inviting staff to bring your own booze to a number 10 lockdown busting party, is expected to leave along with his deputy, Stuart Glassborough. Dan Rosenfield, the chief of staff, and some members of the communications team are also living on borrowed time. Rosenfield is accused of approving the claim that there were no parties in number 10. Boris is preparing to lay down the lies of his staff to save his own, said one MP close to number 10. It will be the night of the long scapegoats. Now for Operation Red Meat. So the name of this plan was apparently coined by Nadine Doris, who said in a cabinet meeting, stop talking about dead cats and start throwing some red meat on the green benches. The green benches being a reference to, to the back benches that the MPs sit on, and or all MPs. And lo and behold, Sunday saw a flurry of right-wing policy briefings from the government, including a plan to end the BBC licence fee, which we'll talk about later, and another story about bringing in the military to stop migrants crossing the channel. On the latter, the Times was happy to play ball and give this vague briefing, which has already been suggested multiple times, its front page splash. 
The cynicism of it all is incredibly transparent, but speaking to the BBC, Education Secretary Nadeem Zahawi denied there was any relationship whatsoever between Boris Johnson's woes and a flurry of policy announcements. No, that doesn't I, happen overnight. You I, can't I, I just I conjure understand. up those things in, 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 on a weekend. All that work takes you know, weeks and months to deliver. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you, you completely deny um, that there's an operation to save Big Dog and then you talk us through exactly the things that apparently were on that list to try and save the Big Dog. But Dan, they're, they're on the list because these are the government's manifesto. These are priorities. The Prime Minister is focused on delivery. That is why they're on the list. They're not on the list because we made them up this weekend. That's my point. Ash, we will be going through, you know, in some more detail, the various elements of Boris Johnson's I mean, pretty desperate rescue plans. But what's your what's your broadest take on what we've what, what we've learned this weekend? Well, in a way, they were both right in that exchange. This is nothing new. The talk of military being used in asylum seeker pushbacks has been going on for months. The attacks on the BBC hanging the sword of Damocles over the license fee. Again, this has been a characteristic part of the Johnson premiership. So Nadeem Zahawi is right in the sense that this is nothing new. Um, the BBC host was completely correct in saying this was a very cynical ploy to remind the two bits of Johnson's base of what it is he says he's going to deliver. Now, we're going to go into the specifics, but I just think it's important to take that broad view of it. Um, these are two policy announcements which are targeted at the two foundational parts of Johnson's support. The first being uh, migrant pushbacks. That is really speaking to that very authoritarian, nationalistic, and I would think deeply racist part of the conservative base who look at asylum seekers, particularly those who've made it across in small boat crossings, and they feel nothing but disdain and disgust. Now, that's not because these people are uniquely bad people. And it's not even because the people looking at them are uniquely bad people. It's because we have had a consistent, a consistently anti-migrant perspective in the national media for decades now. So this is building on a mood that has already been there. So really it's reminding, you know, some of your, you know, older, more conservative, more reactionary voters who live outside of big cities saying, remember, we hate the same people you hate. We're going to have that Australian style border force with offshore detention. We're going to be as mean and nasty as possible. Don't you forget about that. The second thing, of course, is, you know, these threats made over the future of the BBC. Now, the audience for that isn't necessarily the public. Of course, there's a huge amount of variety of opinion about the value of the BBC, how should it be funded, so on and so forth. This is a reminder to the Rupert Murdochs of the world, the Viscount Rothermere's, the Paul Dakers, the, uh, you know, Barclays brothers, who are the conservative-leaning controllers of the UK newspaper environment. 73% of UK newspapers are controlled by conservative supporting billionaires and saying, look, don't forget, I'm your guy. If you prop me up, ease off just a little bit on the tenor of the coverage, I will go for this institution which you deplore and you have hoped would be privatized, eliminated, broken up for decades. So that's what these two announcements are fundamentally about. The other thing that they do is they bring into play two of Boris Johnson's staunchest supporters left in the cabinet. Where's Rishi Sunak? He's not piping up to defend the prime minister because, of course, he wants to take over his job. You're also not seeing anything super supportive or hyper visible from Liz Truss either. But who you do have are, of course, Home Secretary Priti Patel. Uh, the stuff about military pushbacks has been uh, very much in line with what she wants to do for a very long time. And you've got new cultural War Secretary Nadine Dorries, who's perfectly happy being the kind of, you know, attack dog of the Johnson government taking on the BBC. Again, somebody who we've seen in those leaked WhatsApp messages privately I do this for those WhatsApp messages because they're essentially now press briefings by another name, um, privately trying to rally support amongst Conservative MPs. So these are reminders to two bits of his base. They bring in uh, two of the only supporters that he really has left. And in a way, it does show how isolated the prime minister's become. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I suppose Nadine Doris probably wouldn't get a job in a Rishi Sunak cabinet. Ash, there, you've, you've talked about the big guns who aren't coming out in favour of Boris Johnson, but silence is better than what Dominic Cummings is doing. So he tweeted today, updated blog, Prime Minister was told about the invite. He knew it was a drinks party. He lied to Parliament, right? And then he's got a screenshot of his blog, which says, MPs should focus on the basics. The Prime Minister's personal private secretary invited people to a drinks party. The personal private secretary was told to cancel the invite by at least two people. He checked with the PM whether the party should go ahead. The PM agreed it should. They both went to the party. It was actually a drinks party. The PM told MPs repeatedly that he had no idea about any parties. He goes on, the events of 20th May alone, never mind the string of other events, mean the PM lied to Parliament about parties. Not not only me, but other eyewitnesses who discussed this at the time would swear under oath this is what happened. And this is very significant for a number of reasons. Firstly, because, you know, Boris Johnson's argument is he just wandered outside. What he should have done is sort of told people to go inside. But, you know, he didn't want to be a party pooper, etc., etc. This is saying people literally warned him this party should not go ahead. And Boris Johnson said, no, let's do it anyway. So that obviously just makes him look much more guilty than his his own narrative does. The other reason this is very problematic for Boris Johnson is because if he's lied to Parliament, he's broken the ministerial code. And so if he's told Parliament, I didn't know that this was a drinks party, and actually he'd, he'd rubber stamped the idea of having a drinks party, then that all collapses. Whether um, Sue Gray will be interviewing Dominic Cummings is something which is, has not yet been announced, but I would hope that she would consider him to be uh, a relevant party to this investigation. Ash, this does seem, I mean, Dominic Cummings is just so good at just destroying Boris Johnson's career. I might agree with him on lots of things politically, but I'm <laughs> enjoying this. And he is running rings around him, isn't he? I mean, look, we both love a chatty patty, Michael. We love a chatty patty. Um, and Dominic Cummings is the chattiest of them all. Some say silence is violence. Dominic Cummings says, no, violence is violence. And I'm going to show you just how. <laughs> I think that what we can see from Dominic Cummings is that he wants that second shot, I think, at being on camera, you know, in front of MPs, potentially a select committee or some kind of other inquiry gunning for Boris Johnson again. That's why he's saying, I will swear under oath, you know, practically begging Sue Gray to come knocking on his door because he made that now, you know, almost forgotten appearance in front of the uh, uh, select committee talking about the government's COVID response. He had some pretty damning things to say about the culture within Downing Street, the uh, prime minister being paralyzed uh, by indecision, the levels of incompetence, uh, of course, Dominic Cummings can't be wholly trusted on that. Within the frame, predominantly, was Matt Hancock and Boris Johnson. Less so in the frame were Cummings' allies, Sunak or Michael Gove. Mm, funny that. Um, but it didn't stick in the same way. You'd have watched that, uh, that committee performance and would have said that would be a career-ending moment for any other prime minister. Um, a former special advisor right-hand man, man, and many would say the ideological architect of your premiership turning against you in so spectacular a fashion, that would be the end of anybody else. But Boris Johnson, as we've seen, is more than willing to tough it out. You said if he breached the ministerial code that he would have to resign. Well, you, you have to offer your resignation. It's not an automatic or legally binding constitutional process. It demands people respect that being a code of conduct by which ministers abide. Now, we've seen ministers not abide by that before. We've seen uh, Priti Patel, uh, in terms of the bullying allegations, breach the ministerial code. She didn't have to resign. Um, you have multiple ministers, you know, not just ministers, of course, but you know, conservative MPs in general, uh, in flagrant breach of the rules, not offering their uh, resignation from a government post or indeed uh, resigning the whip. And that's because the hallmark of the Johnson government has been try and ride it out. Now, Cummings is having a second bite at the apple when it comes to, you know, operation, you know, if it's operation save big dog, this really is operation old yeller. He's having a second go at it. But if Boris Johnson can tough it out again and bank on the fact that his would-be successors might not want to take the reins 
before these crucial local elections in May, then he might survive it. Um, the ministerial code is is even more ridiculous than people were found to have broken it and they didn't resign because actually the person who has the final say as to whether or not it was broken is the Prime Minister. So in the case of Priti Patel, the civil servant wrote a report which said that she had broken the ministerial code. and But that was just a recommendation to the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister Boris Johnson said, no, she hasn't. Um, so the same thing could happen here. Sue Gray should said, I, I think the Prime Minister's broken the ministerial code. And Boris Johnson could say, no, he hasn't. Um, I think actually it might not even get that far because has he put within her terms of reference to make that judgment or not? That's also, um, another potential weakness of that investigation. Let's go to a couple of comments. Shailendra Singh with a fiver. Thank you very much. This, the unedifying spectacle of an ex-empire putrefying and hurtling towards an adir might run its course before things turn around for the better. I should get you to write my introductions. That was that was very well put. Conmac tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Boris and his cronies would throw their own grands into the Thames if it meant staying in number 10. That does not bode well for any public services like the BBC and the NHS. Public assets are hostage hostages they're willing to rid themselves of when it's politically sound. Um, yeah, very important part. I'll be talking about the BBC specifically in one moment. And Saul says, Sue Gray cannot say if the Prime Minister has broken ministerial code. Only the advisor on ministerial standards can do that. And only the PM tells him to investigate. Oh my God. Well, Shalendra Singh should write my introductions and Saul should check some of my facts because apparently I got that ever so slightly wrong. Um, let's go straight on to the BBC. Nadine Doris has announced that the BBC licence fee will be abolished in 2028. The announcement is widely seen as a ploy to distract from Boris Johnson's current woes and appease his right-wing backbenchers. But if implemented, it could have enormous social consequences. Announcing the move, Doris tweeted... This licence fee announcement will be the last. The days of the elderly being threatened with prison sentences and bailiffs knocking on doors are over. Time now to discuss and debate new ways of funding, supporting and selling great British content. Now, it's pretty disingenuous that we'll watch this put in that tweet because over 75s used to get their licence fee paid for by the government. That was until the Tories stopped funding it. So if anyone over that age were to have the bailiffs come knocking, it would be Doris's party's fault. It's also the case that, well, they haven't. The BBC has confirmed it doesn't send enforcement letters to the over 75s, which is something Doris is aware of. Only this month, she told Parliament, the BBC confirmed recently that no enforcement action has been taken against anyone over 75 years of age at this stage. I am clear that the BBC must support those affected by the decision to end free TV licences for over 75s, and I expect it to do so with the utmost sensitivity. This, of course, isn't the first time that Doris, a highly regarded expert on broadcast funding models, has got her facts wrong. Here she is in November last year. So I would argue that to say that just because Channel 4 has been established as a public service broadcaster and just because it's in receipt of public money, we should never kind of audit the future of Channel 4 and we should never evaluate how Channel 4 looks in the future and whether or not it's a sustainable and viable model. It's quite right that the government should do that. But, but Channel 4 is not like the BBC. Uh, it, it, it's not in receipt of licence fee money. It, no. it, it makes its money from commercial operations. And so, uh, although it's, yeah, and that, I mean, there are a range of views. Obviously, Channel 4 has taken a particular position uh, on the future. Um, there's so can I just say that the discussions about the what we do with Channel 4 and how we evaluate Channel 4 also happened before I arrived yeah. in my post. Yeah, I've no, picked no. this up. And and I feel just so, so I was looking to Sarah to to clarify what you just said on the on the funding. That never gets old. I I love that clip. Um, it is of course unlikely this move by Nardine Doris is is genuinely motivated by any concern for the elderly or the police knocking on anyone's door. Far more likely, this is the Conservatives kind of annoyed that the Conservatives sorry that the BBC is not always towing the preferred government line. They usually do. They usually tow the establishment line at least, but not always the government line. And they're pretty pissed off about that. On the day of the announcement, Kate Hoey spoke to the Rupert Murdoch-owned talk radio. 
Yes, I, I, th- I think there's no doubt about it. And even the new director general um, accepted that there, well, that there was a, a, a kind of culture within the BBC um, that, ha- that was making it very difficult for um, other ideas and other views other than what would be assumed to be the kind of metropolitan liberal view. And, and yeah. I'm afraid that that's what comes across, not just in Brexit. And I have to say, I don't think they're campaigning against Brexit, even though we've left. Has, has has given you know they still got this mindset that something might happen and we can uh, we might be able to go back in again um so the, but i do genuinely i think you're right that there, you know there is a need for good quality programs but of course so many areas now of our coverage are covered by other other yeah. channels extremely well i mean news now i have to say i do not watch bbc news anymore because i don't want to listen to half an hour of sort of almost opinion Tory MP Lee Anderson also made an appearance, this time on a private broadcaster controlled by four shareholders, three of whom reportedly live in the Emirates. That's GB News. I grew up in the 70s in Ashfield. Uh, and at the time, the, the BBC was a place of comfort. It was, it was um, you know, a, um, a TV station that we trusted. I watched, you know, programmes like Grain Chill and Blue Peter and the News Round, and you felt safe watching anti-Beeb, but it's been quite clear over the past 10, 15 years that it's not anti-Beeb anymore, it's just anti-government, anti-establishment, well, say anti-establishment, anti-conservative establishment, and they will do anything they can to to have a pop at government, have a pop at Boris, have a pop at people like me. And quite frankly, you know, if people want to watch this rubbish, then let them have that, have that choice, that personal choice, whether to pay for it or not. It is, however, not just sections of the right who have problems with the BBC. We all remember how they spent five years producing slanderous coverage of Jeremy Corbyn. Of that, there are too many examples to count. We've covered lots of them on Navarra Media. I want to show you one particularly surreal clip, though. This went viral on Twitter this weekend. It's from Newsnight in 2016. The week that uh, J.K. Rowling went to war with the Corbynistas on Twitter over who should lead the Labour Party, we thought that getting into a scrap with one of the country's most influential authors probably wasn't a good idea, as we discovered when Warner Brothers gave us a sneak peek of the next Harry Potter movie. Good night. Tell the truth! What do you see? Let me speak to him. Master, you are not strong enough. I have strength enough for this. Jeremy Corbyn as Lord Voldemort. It's not particularly subtle. Um, Ash, I'm sure we've all got you know somewhat ambivalent feelings towards the BBC. What should we make of this announcement from Doris? I mean, can I just very briefly touch on that news night yeah, please. segment? I don't know. It's not the clip that must not be named. Package that they had the clip that must not be named. <laughs> I mean, for me, what's most embarrassing about it is that it is a Twitter spat between a children's author and not even Jeremy Corbyn himself. Corbynistas who, regardless of whether they're Corbynistas of the stature of Aaron Bastani or Owen Jones, or if they're just you know <laughs> little old dog Abby, really they're just randos on the internet. Just around those on the internet. And I think it demeans a program of Newsnight stature to cover what is essentially a Twitter fight between a children's author and randos with, with that level of um, coverage. I just, I just think it's embarrassing. Um, but of course, the BBC, in terms of its political coverage, its current affairs coverage, is not biased to the left in any way, shape or form. And I could talk about that in terms of my own personal experiences and anecdotes. I remember being on a politics live panel where it was myself, uh, Philip Collins, not the drummer from Genesis, but the former Blair speechwriter, Kwasi Kwarteng of the Conservatives, uh, I believe Miranda Green from the Liberal Democrats. And there was a segment called Are the Hard Left Uniquely Nasty? And everybody turned on me. Absolutely everybody turned on me. And I was like, hmm, this isn't, I'm not enjoying that, you know, Marxist, uh, you know, left wing conspiracy that, um, you know, flag Twitter go on about. This actually feels pretty damn hostile. 
And you can also back it up in in terms of statistics. The majority of BBC news stories, and this is also true for the entirety of the broadcast news environment, have their origins in right-wing newspapers. And I do think that there's a problem that an organisation of the BBC's size doesn't seem to be breaking an awful lot of you know hard news stories and in fact lots of its so-called breaking stories were lobby stories it was just people whatsapping laura coonsberg so i do think that there are big big problems with this news and current affairs programming but those aren't the problems so-called which are being identified by the authoritarian and reactionary right uh Kate Hoey, uh, Lee Anderson, Nadine Dorries, whatever it was that catapulted them to this level of uh, public life, certainly wasn't intelligence. Those are three people who took to broadcast today in order to insult uh, the intelligence of the audience and indeed actively uh, mislead them. Um, it's simply not the case that what the BBC used to be was comforting Auntie B, but now it's, you know, sort of scary, woke apocalypse. It's also sort of weird that Lee Anderson goes, oh, when I was a child, it was all Blue Peter, and now I'm an adult. It's, you know, things like Newsnight, Panorama, it's very scary. Yeah, no wonder you felt really safe in the 70s. You were a child watching children's programming. Mm. Um, as for the <laughs> stuff about the BBC supposedly campaigning against Brexit. That's pure fantasy. Um, and Nadine Dorries, I mean, come on, come on. She doesn't even know what's in her remit. Um, her ability to talk with any authority about public service broadcasting is a joke. She is one of the most underqualified cabinet ministers I can think of in my lifetime. It's almost like a Trump appointment. Here's somebody who mouths off on Twitter and then you give them one of, you know, the biggest government departments you can find to run simply because you quite like them as a media performer and an attack dog. I do just think it's important to say that I don't necessarily think that this is set in stone, this is going to happen. The date of 2028 is far away. What this is, is signaling to those right-wing papers that it's not going to be Boris Johnson trying to save his premiership by pally-pallying with the BBC. It's going to be by attacking it. Now, as for the BBC, sorry, I know I said that was going to wind up, but I do just have this one last thing to say. The BBC as an organisation is suffused with conservative supporters at the executive level. You could have that be, uh, you know, Tim Davey, um, Nick Robinson, who's, of course, you know, chief interviewer for the Today program, the flagship uh, political uh, radio broadcast, you know, used to run uh, his university conservative party. This is not Navara Media and bigger offices, Michael. And this isn't just right wing from the perspective as me and you who would, you know, talk about the Blairite tradition as being right wing. This is objectively right wing. But the BBC traipsing after the Conservative Party has not been enough to ensure a guarantee of its survival. So if we want to talk about what the future of the BBC is, we can talk about different funding models, what's appropriate, sure. But nothing is going to work unless the BBC is capable of speaking up in the interest of its own survival. It cannot be neutral on the issue of its own survival, and it cannot negotiate with or kowtow to those who would kick its head in, quite frankly. As far as I'm concerned, Ash, that comment about Lee Anderson gave you the right to talk for it as, as long as you wanted. That was um, hilarious. I think Blue Peter is still around, right? He could just watch it. If, if that's what makes him feel comfortable, but I'll, I'll, I'll check that in a moment. Um, we have three and a half thousand people watching the show. If you are enjoying it, please do hit the like button. What will replace the license fee is as yet unspecified. And the government are saying that now the ball is in the BBC's court. They should come up with the shape of a new settlement, some new funding model that will be more acceptable to the government and, you know, in the government's word, the public. Now, that could be from general taxation. That would risk the government having even more influence if, if they're able to turn the taps on and off in a more direct way than they currently are. It could also be via a subscription service like Netflix or Amazon. Potentially more likely, it could be a bit of both. Now, the comparison with subscription services has got lots of people debating whether the BBC's current offer is or isn't 
value for money. A BBC licence currently costs £159 a year, which is £13.25 a month or 43p a day. Of course, I should have said the TV licence fee instead of the BBC licence fee. Dan Walker hosts BBC Breakfast and presumably does think it's value for money. On Sunday, he tweeted 43p per day and then shared this graphic which shows iPlower, BBC Sounds, BBC Scotland, all of the radio stations, CBBC. The point he's making is essentially you get a lot for that money. Um, That hasn't sort of had a positive reaction from everyone. Julia Hartley Brewer who works at Talk Radio, so uh, a Rupert Murdoch stable. She tweeted that same graph with lots of those crossed out. She says, I pay the BBC licence fee and these are the only services I ever use. Good value for money with a shrug. And she's crossed out everything other than BBC iPlayer, BBC One, BBC Two, BBC News, BBC Parliament, BBC Radio 4 and BBC Radio 5. And there are, I suppose, a, a couple of things to say about that tweet from Julie Hartley Brewer. Which is one, the whole point of the BBC having a variety of output is that some people are going to watch some of it and other people are going to watch other bits of it. It's not intended that everyone watches all of it. You can't say the NHS isn't worthwhile because I didn't get cancer. I got, um, I had a stroke. Just because you had a stroke doesn't mean that the NHS isn't value for money because the whole point of it is it it it, 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 it sort of um, services the, the diversity of our needs. The other point is that I play a, BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Parliament, Radio Four, Radio Five. That's actually quite a lot of content that that um, Julie Hartleyborough consumes. I, I, I mean, I assume, especially with iPlayer, which is all of the visual content that the BBC produces, it to me sounds like Julie Hartleyborough consumes about ninety percent. You know, w- what accounts for ninety percent of the BBC's budget? Ash, um, I suppose, regardless of Julie Hartleyborough and what she thinks, do you think the BBC is value for money? Do I think the BBC is value for money? I think that's a wrong way to phrase the question because the obvious answer is yes, but that's not a particularly good answer. And I don't think that tells you very much about what challenges the BBC face going into the future. 43p a day to support that range of content, uh, that range of platforms is obviously very, very good. Um, What isn't so good is that it doesn't seem to me that the BBC has really adapted to the changing viewing habits of the streaming world. So the average age of the BBC viewer, and indeed uh, the BBC Radio 4 listener, is going up. And you have this you know, huge audience of much younger streamers, many of whom, I'm afraid to say, probably don't pay the license fee. So how you engage those people? Well, sure, making really quality in particular, fictional content is one way of doing it. I personally would take any one of the BBC dramas over the native content uh, made for and streamed on Netflix or Amazon alone. I think that even though they clearly have the budget, they haven't delivered on the quality. You can really uh, pick from a handful of really quality, um, you know, prestige streaming series whereas the bbc is knocking out you know two or three of those every quarter that's quite a phenomenal rate if you're like me really into fiction of middle class people being miserable in palatial homes i love it um but the challenge is picking up younger viewers and also rebuilding some support for its current affairs and news programming like i said the bbc when it comes to uh other news organizations doesn't seem to break that many stories. It's following the lead from newspapers. So I would like a lot more um, money put towards investigations, towards breaking stories, and towards putting them out in a way which can engage new audiences. You do have, you know, in terms of media audiences, a hugely frustrated uh, nation. You know, no one feels particularly well served by broadcast news. And so that's something that really has to change. And I don't think you do that by slavishly following the government of the day. Dust in my throat. The really critical thing is that the BBC needs to not be vulnerable to the government of the day when it comes to the charter renewal process. Jeremy Corbyn talked about establishing the BBC on a permanent statutory footing. He would have been the prime minister to protect the BBC. And yet the journalists uh, at BBC News 
uh, treated him like he was he was Voldemort. It was honestly a joke. Um, Ash, I'm going to go through some comments and then we've got a clip. So you have got time to go get a glass of water if you need a refreshment. Um, let's go to some comments. Oliver Camp with a fiver. A great irony is that BBC was set up by the Tories in the 1920s with the prospect of using it to control public opinion. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of details about that in Tom Mill's excellent book, um, BBC The Myth of a Public Service, which I have read, but quite a long time ago, so I forgot most of the details. On Twitch, Gigi Hadidn writes, it's nice to see the likes of the Beeb get their comeuppance for groveling to this government, but I'm also deeply saddened that we're losing a troubled but great institution. Again, sort of the ambivalence that we were talking about reflected there. And Tom Cornford tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. Like Brexit, the BBC question is strategically genuinely difficult for the left. Can we coherently articulate a robust defence of public service broadcasting that is also a fundamental fundamental critique of the core public service broadcaster if not the right wins either way that is i mean that is the strategic question for the left we will be talking a lot about that um, on tisky sours to come i am sure let's go to our next story Boris Johnson's partying exploits seem likely to end his prime ministership and seriously damage the Tories. That's got some of the right-wing papers flustered, including the Daily Mail, who are trying to shift focus to Keir Starmer. On Saturday, their front page read, Starmer, the Covid party hypocrite. And on Monday, the paper led with, Starmer must say sorry for drinks in lockdown. The basis for both front pages is a photo of, of Keir Starmer holding a bottle of beer taken through a window before the May elections. It was taken on April the 30th, 2021, at which time government guidelines stated, you must not socialise indoors except with your household or support bubble. Speaking to Sophie Rayworth, Starmer argued no rules were broken. I was in a constituency office just days before the election. We were very busy. We were working in the office um, and we stopped for something to eat. And then we carried on working. That is the long, the short of it. No party, no breach of the rules and absolutely no comparison with the Prime Minister. And, but there um, were rules in place. You, this was step two uh, guidelines at the time. No person may participate in a gathering in the step two area which consists of two or more people and takes place indoors unless it's reasonably necessary for work purposes. We were in the office, the constituency office. It was days before the election. We were very busy. We were working. Um, at some point, some food turned up. We stopped, we had our food, and then we carried on working. That is not a breach of the rules. It's not a party, and it is no comparison to the Prime Minister. Drinking and the fact a beer, that but the drinking a beer, is that reasonably necessary for work purposes? We'd, we'd stopped to eat a takeaway whilst we were working in the office, and then we carried on. This was, but, just but to word... put it in context, this was about uh, a few days before the May elections. We were really busy. We were, we'd been at it all day on Zoom calls. Uh, we were doing members' calls from that very office. We stopped because food arrived, the, um, the, and then the we carried on. There were rules in place, and the guidance, the workplace guidance, that was in place at the time. Participants should physically attend meetings only where reasonably necessary. There should not be any sharing of food and drink by staff who do not share a household. Well, Sophie, uh, uh, you, trying to persuade anybody that stopping to have some food when you're in the office all day working um, is a breach of the rules is just not going to wash. And it shows just how far the Conservatives are sinking, that they're trying to pretend there's some sort of comparison between this and the industrial scale parting that the Prime Minister has been but up to. Nadim Zahawi has been trying to bring up this photo of Starmer in TV interviews. So it's clearly the Cabinet's line to take. They're told... If they bring up Boris Johnson partying, bring up that picture of Keir Starmer. Ash, is this a big problem for Labour? I don't think it's a huge problem, no. If you look at when these pictures first emerged, they were circulated uh, quite a while ago now, a few months ago, if not um, you know, several weeks ago. And they've only just now made front page news. So I think that most people can see through it as a cynical ploy. I think at worst they'll go, oh, politicians, they were all at it. But ultimately, that's not a reprieve for Boris Johnson. I think one of the problems for Starmer, and this goes back to something that we've mentioned a few times, which is now he's saying something quite reasonable, which is, look, if you have in the rules a stipulation saying that nobody who is working in the same office together can then share food or drink together in that same office space. That's ridiculous. That's not going to wash. No one can really do that. It's unreasonable. Sure, that's great. But 
not that long before, he had waved those rules through without bringing that up as a point, saying, actually, this is something which is, um, you know, at odds with providing decent conditions for workers to do their jobs in. So for me, that's the problem with Starmer. It's not whether or not he's as bad as Boris Johnson, whether or not he's somebody who, you know, secretly been partying on the slight. I don't think he has, but if he had, I imagine that there'd be more to go on than a picture through a window. The problem was, is that if that rule is unreasonable now, you've been caught doing it, it's probably unreasonable at the time that you waved it through. Mm. I mean, I, I think from my perspective, the issue is, because what what happened in the rest of that interview on, on, on the BBC was that she was saying, look, even if you don't think this is a big deal, it's exactly what Boris Johnson did when he was having that beer in the garden and that picture was taken. Potentially he was working and having a drink. Well, one, his wife was there, so it looks a bit different anyway. But two, I think the dates of those matter. So So Boris Johnson's was in the first lockdown. And the first lockdown was quite different to the second and third lockdowns in the sense that, you know, everyone was really quite terrified. The attitude to to lockdown were quite different then. In the time period when that picture of Keir Starmer was taken, that was when there was the party in Downing Street where 100 people were invited and Boris Johnson attended. So I think you've got to compare that picture of him having that drink through the window with Boris Johnson going to a party to which 100 people were invited, which according to Dominic Cummings, Boris Johnson gave the go-ahead. So I think on this one, Keir Starmer is right that there is no comparison between the two events. Let's go straight on to our next story. Demonstrators across the UK gathered on Saturday to protest new and draconian legislation that would limit the right to protest. But action took place in 30 cities across the UK. So people were chanting, kill the bill. And demonstrators were opposing the police crime sentencing and courts bill. The bill, if it passes, would rule out protests that the Home Secretary considers too noisy or demonstrations that might make members of the public feel uneasy. It also discriminates against traveller communities. It's, of course, understandable why people are so upset. Amnesty International have pointed out that, legis that under this legislation, some vital historic protests could have been illegal. For instance, early gay pride marches were seen as disruptive and likely to cause unease to the public, especially the sight of same-sex couples kissing. The new bill would have given the police the power to arrest the participants. During the 80s, anti-apartheid protesters maintained a continuous and loud presence outside the South African embassy in Trafalgar Square. Protesters were regularly arrested, but none were penalised. Under this bill, the police and courts would have been able to jail the protesters. The bill would also allow Priti Patel to mark certain locations out of bounds for protests, in particular Parliament Square which has been used to confront the government with public outrage on, on many occasions. That includes this protest organised in response to police brutality at the Sarah Everard Memorial. The draconian bill went through its first stages in Parliament last year. Boris Johnson's got quite a, a big majority, so it didn't, he didn't have much problems. But then in December, while the bill was in the Lords, the government dumped in even more authoritarian amendments, bypassing scrutiny. In the Commons. And these new amendments have been widely criticised from across the political spectrum. Speaking to the Today programme, Baroness Camilla, Camilla Cavendish, now a crossbencher but formerly a Conservative peer, said this. I think it's an age-old right, Justin, that if you or I are angry or concerned about something, we can step outside our front doors and shout about it. Um, that is protest. And what worries me about this bill is it's very widely drawn and it's very vaguely worded and it really uses noise for the first time as a way for police to decide whether you or I are criminals. It actually extends even to one person protest. So if you or I wanted to sit on a street corner um, shouting, um, the police now have very widely drawn powers to decide uh, whether we are causing what they call in the bill serious annoyance or serious inconvenience. Now, that is very subjective. It's up to somebody else to decide. And I think, really, we are sleepwalking into a police state if we allow these clauses to go really? through. That's yes, I do. Amnesty International have compared the measures being proposed to anti-protest laws in Belarus and Russia, and human rights organisation Justice has argued that the new laws would clearly breach our right to freedom of expression and assembly. 
Most frighteningly, this new legislation would allow the Home Secretary Priti Patel to criminalise protesters, banning them from protests for up to five years. The bill is being debated in the House of Lords this evening before returning to the Commons. Earlier, I spoke to one of the peers challenging the legislation, Shami Chakrabarti. What I'm really concerned about today uh, is part three. These are the anti-protest provisions of the police bill, and they come in two parts. Now, there's the part that's already been through the House of Commons and that many people watching will have heard about. These are powers to make noise or impact um, uh, grounds for the police to interfere with protests. Uh, this will include making it a criminal offence to breach police conditions, even conditions that you didn't know about. Now, all of that has been debated some time ago last year when the bill was first published and as it went through its swift passage in the House of Commons. But part three now has an additional part. This is the equivalent of a whole new bill that's been dropped into the uh, part three of the police pit bill at this very late stage, which is uh, tonight report stage in the second chamber, the unelected House of Lords. Now, this time we're not just talking about peaceful protesters being treated as criminals. This time they're going to be treated as terrorists. We've got new offences of not just of locking on, which means attaching yourself to, to people, land or property. It could be something as innocent as locking arms with your comrades on a march or demonstration um, or, or, or using a bike lock. It's a associated offences of going equipped to lock on. So that's having the bike lock in your rucksack on the bicycle when you head for the demo. Uh, we're also talking about new stop and search powers, including without suspicion, not just uh, not this time aimed at, at, at terror suspects or knife knife carriers, but this time aimed just at protesters. We're looking at new um, exacerbated offences of obstructing the highway, even though obstructing the highway has long been a criminal offence. And we're looking at new civil criminal orders that have been modelled on ASBOs and terrorism prevention orders that would allow the police to place restrictions on people so that they can't protest for, 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 for many months and potentially years ahead, even when they haven't been convicted uh, of an offence. Amnesty International have compared some of these measures to those that we're currently seeing in places like Russia, Hong Kong and Belarus. That's not my comparison, that's Amnesty International. Uh, and the government, of course, laughs all of this off as hyperbole. But you know, this is a government that once encouraged pro-Brexit demonstrators, encouraged statue defenders. Um, this is a government that bangs on about free speech and cancel culture, but it's one law for them and uh, another for people who disagree with them. As far as I understand, because those amendments you were just describing then were brought in quite late in the day by the government, that means the Lords actually have quite a lot of power here, don't they? If, if it's voted down in the Lords, those amendments just fall. Is, is that the case? Will that be the end of story if you vote them down today? In relation to this brand new bill within a bill, so that's the locking on and the new suspicion, the stop and search and the civil criminal orders, you're quite right. They are not currently part of the bill. Uh, the government plans to add them in a vote probably in the middle of the night tonight in the second chamber. So you're quite right. If they fall tonight, as I hope they will, if all opposition parties, cross benches and even sort of, you know, liberal one nation Tories that are left in the on those Lords benches, if they vote down these new measures tonight, then they fall. And if the government wants to introduce them, they would need uh, to do what what they ought to do, which is to introduce a, 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 a new bill from scratch in the House of Commons, something that they have chosen not to do until now. What's happening today in the Lords, very important about these specific parts of it added late in the day. Lots of people will be quite disheartened that you know the rest of it is going to go through. There's an enormous majority for it in the Commons there was. What would you say to people that they can do next if they're upset about the core part of the, the police and crime bill having passed? Well, I hope that the that the kill the bill movement that has developed in response to to the whole of this bill 
really, um, in no small part because as, as a partnership between the Black Lives Matter movement and the climate catastrophe, um, uh, anti-climate catastrophe movement, including Extinction Rebellion and, and lots of other civil society groups. I hope that that movement will continue um, because, you know, it, it, obviously it's harder once measures have passed, but then there are battles to have uh, in the courts, in, in public discourse as this bill uh, becomes an act and ends up being applied. We, 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 you know, we, we we can't just let this go, and it, it's a hard road. But I've seen in the past that um, you know, obviously it's easier if you can to de- to defeat measures when they're going through Parliament. But uh, but sometimes it takes a little bit of uh, of practical outcomes and litigation in the courts for governments present and future to realise that people do actually care about their civil liberties, and 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 legislation can with the right momentum, be repealed. On the one hand, these are kind of issues that Keir Starmer and his team, I can't imagine, want to make a big fuss defending people from Extinction Rebellion. It's not really um, one of their priorities at the moment. Yet they have a, you know, they have agreed to, to whip the Lords to vote down those amendments. Are you sort of pleasantly surprised by that decision, by the, the Lords whips from the Labour Party? I think there's been a broad coalition uh, in the House of Lords including crossbenchers, uh, uh, some liberal conservatives, uh, liberal Democrats, Greens and, and Labour people. And I might, might add Labour people from across the, the traditional spectrum in the, uh, in the Labour Party. We've, had, we've heard from people like um, David Blunkett on the one hand, Cam- Camilla Cavendish on the other, Brian Paddock, the, the Greens, of course, Bennett, and Jones and people like me. So I think that the, the coalition has been broad, almost a popular front in response to this, this increasingly far-right and authoritarian government. And I think that moment, as well as the broad coalition of opinion outside Westminster, including on the streets, is, is, has perhaps what's made the case against this, against this measure. That was Shami Chakrabarti speaking to me earlier today. And as she said there, there will be voting on those key amendments later this evening. Let's go straight on to our next story. As we've seen over the past two years, so long as they are loyal, cabinet members have to be exceptionally incompetent to be sacked by Boris Johnson. And Gavin Williamson, more than anyone else in government, fits that bill. From failing to get laptops to schools, to botching exam results, to confusing Maro Itajate to Marcus Rashford, Williamson was absolutely useless. And this was a point which was often made to his face in TV interviews. Have you offered your resignation to the Prime Minister at any stage of this pandemic? Yes or no? Our focus, my focus, is making sure that children get the best remote know, education while they're not in school. Of course it is. You're the Education Our Secretary. I expect it to be. be. But have you offered your uh, resignation? Our focus is making sure that children is. return Have you to offered your resignation? at possible moment. And, uh, Piers, the other thing that we're doing... Is there we're a problem also, on, the, on the line? Can you not hear me? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Mr Williamson, focus, you're not, you seem to be totally ignoring me. I'm just asking you a straight question. Given the level fo- of failure no. in your reign as Education Secretary in this pandemic, given that 92% what? of teachers in England want you to go, given that uh, you're being described by the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats as the worst education secretary in British history, I simply ask you, have you looked in the mirror and thought, you know what, I've done a terrible job, I'm going to say to the Prime Minister, it's time for me to step aside and let somebody more competent take over. Have you had that conversation with yourself and have you then had it with the Prime Minister? Piers, my one focus is making sure we deliver the very best We know what your focus is. You're the education and, secretary. Uh, the problem is your focus has not proven doing. to be very good, has it? Um, uh, that, you know, we're dealing with a global pandemic where we've had to make decisions at incredible pace, decisions that none of us would have wanted You've to have You've made a series of bad decisions, Education Secretary, decisions that have had huge ramifications for teachers, for students, for parents. You've been a catastrophe. Own it. That interview was from last January. It would take another nine months for Boris Johnson to finally sack 
Williamson. And we now have a clue as to how that conversation went. The context here is that under Theresa May, Gavin Williamson was the Tory chief whip. In that role, it's the whip's job to get dirt on MPs to use as leverage to get them to vote with the government. That means he likely had some dirt on Boris Johnson. For Johnson, that meant sacking him came with a risk. You don't want to make an enemy of the person who knows where the bodies are buried. But we now have a hint as to how he squared that circle. In exchange for his silence, Johnson offered the hapless Gavin Williamson a knighthood. In a piece on Boris Johnson's strategy, Tim Shipman wrote in the Sunday Times that Gavin Williamson, John John Whittingdale and Nick Gibb all of whom were dumped from government, will be handed knighthoods in the next honours list to keep them quiet. Ash, this is all entirely predictable, but that doesn't make the prospect of a Sir Gavin Williamson any less gross. What's your take? Well, I thought it was quite funny when you said you don't want to sack someone who knows where the bodies are buried. I think in Boris Johnson's case, it might be where the child support payments are going. Um, (laughs) He's got a. <laughs> um, I mean, do we still have a definite figure on how many he's got? I think it's seven. It was six or seven. I think it's now seven or eight. Oh, look, the minute you have to have an or in there, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? I don't know how many kids I've got. Zero. <laughs> um, but look, <laughs> uh, that I know of. Um, when it comes to Gavin Williamson, he had a really important talent in being a minister in particularly a conservative uh, administration, which is the ability to smile inanely into a camera as you're being utterly savaged on your record. And this is something that Gavin Williamson had to do again and again, because he excelled himself with mediocrity in every post that he's ever held. He's not somebody who's distinguished himself Uh, for his great political strategy, for his uh, policy vision, for his insight, for his quick thinking. He's a man who boasted about having a tarantula in his office, and I am 80% certain sleeps in a race car bed. He is a child in a grown man's body in a badly fitting suit. And that was his time in office. And it would be funny if it didn't imperil the futures of so many young people in this country with a botched approach to deciding GCSE and A-level results, which totally baked in deprivation, regional deprivation, geographic deprivation, inequality between schools into each individual result. All right. He is somebody who should never have been in public life in the first place, let alone holding a ministerial position. And so to award him with a knighthood, which is supposed to be about rewarding excellence, is a cruel joke. And the person the joke is being played on, I'm afraid, is all of us, is the British public. But I think what it does is this isn't a mistake. This isn't, you know, an insult to what the knighthood stands for. What this is, is peeling back the veil and showing it for what it really is. You look through the honour system and its way of rewarding a uh, particular service done to not the public, the, but the British establishment, uh, to advancing the interests of those who are already born into wealth and power and doing your bit by getting your hands dirty in order to preserve it. So, Gavin Williamson is a man who, as you said, uh, knows where the bodies are buried, probably knows where the child support payments are going, definitely. And as someone whose main job as minister wasn't to push through some, you know, wonderful reform of the British education system, but was to just grin inanely as, you know, teenager after teenager, you know, popped up on your screen in tears going, that's my life plan out the window. Um, so, you know, he earned his bauble as far as I'm concerned, and he deserves to be up there, you know, with such luminaries as Lord Bell of Bell Pottinger, you know, Baroness Hoey of Brexit Boat. Do you know what I mean? Um, that's the honour system. That's the, uh, you know, unelected House of Lords all over. That's, you know, every Sir in CBE and OBE. Uh, you know, there's a couple of notable exceptions, but in a way it devalues them for having accepted the gongs and being placed alongside the likes of Gavin Williamson. 
There is absolutely nothing I can add to that remarkable description of Gavin Williamson and his probable race car bed. So we're going to go straight on to our next story. One consequence of the incestuous relationship between our political and media class is that if you're an eaten educated prime minister, it's not just political allies that will defend you on air, but well-known family members. What's more, said family members might not be challenged by an interviewer when they make those defences because they host the show themselves. This is Rachel Johnson on LBC. As you might have guessed, it hasn't been the quietest, uh, calmest of weeks. In the Johnson family, and lots of uh, broadcasters, uh, BBC among them, have asked me to uh, contribute on uh, events uh, across Westminster. And, and of course, the repercussions are across the country. And I haven't said anything because I talk to you, LBC listeners. I take your calls. And what I say, I want to say to you. And I know that what I'm going to say is going to sound a bit strange, but I didn't see much of the Prime Minister and his family during lockdown. But the times I did see him, he was completely compliant. He dotted every I, he crossed every T. If it was rule of six, there were six. And what I didn't see was all the things that you've been reading about. For example, his birthday, it was me, my three brothers, Carrie and Wilf. That was six people. And I have to tell you something else about my brother's character. I mean, you've been seeing, obviously, the front pages couldn't have been worse. You know, suitcases of booze going into Downing Street from the co-op on the Strand. I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that he has never once turned to me or any member of my family and said, I tell you what, let's have an office party or I tell you what, let's have a party. I mean, if anything, he would say, let's play reading uh, when we were growing up or even in our 20s. Or let's play who can memorise the most poems from the Oxford Book of Verse as that, you know, who can memorise the most. And of course, it was always him. Look, I'm just telling you what I saw. I'm just telling you what I saw over lockdown and what I know of my brother's character. Um, And to my mind, if he did go out into the garden and he's told us he did, for him, that would have been work. Um, He may have had a drink. I don't know. Is that one of the key questions? But that would have been work. So because Boris Johnson never asked his family members to have a party, he doesn't like parties and therefore wouldn't have attended one in Downing Street, whatever images we've seen. Also, the most important question for me, Ash, what is playing reading? And what is playing reading as something that someone would do in their 20s? Let's play reading. Super bizarre, wasn't it? Is is she helping Boris Johnson's cause? I'll tell you what it's playing. It's playing all of us for fools, Michael. It's one of those absurd lies that it can't even come out of the mouth fully formed. Do you know what I mean? It's like, ah, uh, he loved playing. Um, okay, not chess. Nobody will believe that. Um, football, uh, okay, no. Uh, rugby, oh, it's just going to remind them of that time that he, like, you know, completely clattered a child. Uh, reading, reading. He loved, he loved playing the game of reading. And he always won the game of reading. <laughs> Um, it, it, I, I mean, look, I, I don't think I've got much to say about that particular LBC statement because all of our viewers can see it for what it is, which is a grotesque form of solidarity because this for the Johnsons is a family business. You have Stanley Johnson who has been presented as a sort of pater familias for the Conservative Party, purely because he's Boris Johnson's father and, you know, he stood for office and failed a couple of times. Rachel Johnson has had her media career revived off the back of uh, her brother. And while I haven't met the entirety of the Johnson clan, I mean, God knows how many there are, I have actually had to spend a bit of time with Stanley Johnson and I've met Rachel Johnson. And they are, I'm sorry to say, completely ghastly. And that's not because they're discourteous. It's not because they're impolite. It's because I've never seen people more magnetically attracted 
to the presence of a camera because it gives them the opportunity to sort of bloviate across the place and project how important and well connected they are. And oh, darling, and oh, this, and oh, that. It's honestly, there aren't that many people who generally make my skin crawl. That, you know, there are plenty of people I've met who are my political opponents. There are plenty of people I've met doing media and I've gone, I really hate what you stand for. And I think ultimately you're an agent of evil. But it is rare to see people so nakedly in it for their own self advancement and for the self advancement of their family. It is, you know, pure sleazy showbiz. That's all there is to it. And with, you know, Boris on the rocks, I wouldn't be surprised if Rachel Johnson's thinking, well, okay, how much more time do I have as, you know, host of this LBC spot? Who's going to want to talk to me when my brother's not the prime minister anymore? And that's the reason for the defence. Not because, you know, Boris Johnson is a uniquely intellectual powerhouse whose favorite pastime is to read from the Oxford Book of Verse, you know, picking a verse from Wordsworth and going, uh, what's that then? Um, you know, it's complete bullshit. No, I, I think that point about them just being obsessed with the camera is is, is quite important. It also kind of makes sense because the most... The thing that you can do that most clearly means that you're sort of like an attention seeker who just loves being listened to and loves being watched is if you are willing to insert yourself in any story, however grim, however much a normal human being would want absolutely nothing to do it do with it. And Rachel Johnson recently wrote an article when Ghislaine Maxwell was on, she was in the news because she was on trial for sex trafficking minors. She got found guilty. And Rachel Johnson thought, oh, I've got a good anecdote who I can tell about this. I remember once walking into a common room in Oxford University when she had her hand on my brother's knee. But no one would reveal that unless you are just obsessed with people talking about you because so, so bizarre. Um, Pig Mingus with a tenor says, great interview with Shami. What do these morons expect to happen once they've made peaceful resistance impossible? Do they think people willing to glue themselves to the motorway are just going to quit? Super important point, especially as, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what happens because Extinction Rebellion have often made a key plank of their strategy. We want to go to prison because we think if we go to prison, that will prove to people how seriously we take this. So, how they respond, you know, once this is implemented will be incredibly interesting. Obviously, a lot will depend on whether those um, amendments get voted down this evening. Before we go to our final story, please, if you want to support Navarra Media, go to navaramedia.com slash support. We ask for the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. Um, and we are so forever grateful of all of the kind support we've had up to now. It's you guys that makes all of this possible. Let's go to our final story. In another desperate move in his ongoing civil case with Virginia Giuffre, Prince Andrew's lawyers have demanded that she turn over her mental health records. They've also asked to interview her therapist in order to probe her on the question of false memories. As you'll probably be aware, Virginia Giuffre is suing Andrew over allegations that he sexually assaulted her in 2001. Virginia Roberts, as she was known then, was only 17 and in the hands of convicted paedophile Jeffrey Epstein and sex trafficker Ghislaine Maxwell. Andrew denies all charges. Now Andrew's lawyers, in a summary of his defence, have made this suggestion. Andrew contends that Giuffre may suffer from false memories, as evidenced by the fact that her claims regarding her time with Epstein and the circumstances under which Andrew allegedly assaulted her have repeatedly changed over the years. This defence has been attempted before. In Ghislaine Maxwell's trial, she also employed an expert witness to argue for the theory of false memories. That did not end well. She was convicted on five out of six charges and faces up to 65 years in prison. Jeffrey's lawyer, David Boys, was quick to clap back at Andrew's tactics. So he said, people may misremember a lot of things, but they don't misremember sexual abuse by a prince of England. In addition, Prince Andrew needs to say that all the other people who saw them together also have false memories. And how does a false memory create a photograph? 
Jeffrey's lawyer there referring to the, this notorious picture of Andrew with Virginia Jeffrey allegedly in 2001. And lawyer Brad Edwards, who represents many of Epstein's victims, said this about Andrew's strategy. It's so tone deaf that it basically amounts to litigation suicide. Taking another play out of the Epstein Maxwell book and attacking Virginia is probably the only thing he can do to look worse. I'd say his defence can't get worse, but last time I thought that, he went on TV and gave what amounted to the most embarrassingly stupid interview of all time. These quotes are great. Um, very articulate lawyers. They weren't alone in finding Andrew's plan revolting. Barrister and academic Dr. Charlotte Proudman told The Times, it's the ultimate in victim blaming. A lot of victims of abuse understandably reach out for therapeutic support. Andrew's lawyers are trying to discredit her. They are trying to find something she might have said to the psychologist that potentially undermines the claim she has made or to show potential inconsistencies. I think it's one of the lowest forms of tactics that can be used. And we also have a quote from Professor Claire McGlynn, who said, defence lawyers used to always put forward evidence of sexual history, and some of that has been closed off legally. Now it has moved from sluts to nuts. Instead of framing women as sluts, they try to claim they are nuts. Ash, this is, I mean, as all of those sort of statements suggest, incredibly low, isn't it? I also don't think if we are to compare what Virginia Jeffrey is saying, what Prince Andrew has gone on Newsnight to say, that she's the one telling an outlandish story. She's somebody who was trafficked by Epstein. She was somebody who ended up settling with Epstein to protect him from uh, criminal or civil, civil actions because he had sexually exploited her. And Prince Andrew is the one saying, I'm physically incapable of sweating. I couldn't have possibly sexually abuse this girl because I was at Pizza Express at the time for a birthday party that nobody can seemingly remember me having attended. So if you want to talk about outlandish stories, which might be a figment of the teller's imagination, Virginia Jeffrey isn't the person I would pin for that. Now, just to talk about the issue of false memories um, very briefly, um, this is also a misuse of something that courts and psychologists had to become aware of because false or implanted memories haven't really tended to be uh, just somebody is mistakenly operating uh, on the belief that they were abused and no such thing happened. It tends to be something that happens either with an awful lot of coaching. So somebody is told again and again, by somebody else, you were abused, probably when they were a child or being told that they were abused when they were a child. Or there are a few cases, I think in the 80s and 90s, where the issue of repressed memories of abuse became something of a fad in the psychology world. And you had a pretty uh, famous book about repressed memories where a psychologist claimed to have worked with a woman uh, who uncovered these repressed memories of uh, her parents initiating her into a kind of satanic sex cult. And then ultimately, when you looked back over these claims, it was a very troubling relationship between the psychologist and the patient. The story emerged over time and it kept on developing because it was being reinforced through the therapeutic relationship. So yes, false memories can exist. Yes, implanted memories can exist. But not so often uh, when you've got somebody saying that the abuse that happened to them, uh, you know, happened to them when they were, on, they were a minor, but they weren't in early childhood at that stage where you can't really remember things. You can remember snatches of feelings and, you know, bits of events and there's, you know, a kind of lot of fuzzy material to work with. Or it happens over an awful lot of time of, you know, um, the story being worked through between, you know, somebody in a vulnerable position and somebody who's more in a position of power, uh, whether that's somebody doing outright coaching, uh, like a parent, for instance, or a psychologist, somebody who you're very vulnerable with in the therapeutic relationship. So this is a complete misuse of this real thing that can happen. And it looks incredibly cynical to me. And the reason why I know all this is because my mother's a social worker. We're going to wrap up there. And we've, we've ended on 
an incredibly serious topic, but I have to say, Ash, you have made me laugh so much this evening. So, you know, on, on the less on the on the stories that weren't quite as serious as that final one, I have to just say say thank you for the for the joy you've given me today. Um and thank you as ever for joining me on tonight's show. Thank you so much for watching Tisky Sour tonight. We'll be back on Wednesday at 7 p.m. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night. Thank you.